uh, 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, if you're taking notes. And it says, The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elijah, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as slaves. Elijah replied her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she replied, except a small jar of olive oil. Elijah said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside, shut the door behind you and your son. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. Then she left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. <laughs> then the oil stopped flowing. That is an incredible story. It kind of reminds me of the same story of Jesus feeding the multitudes. That one should have been called the bread kept flowing communion service. And it's amazing when we get an opportunity to read an Old, Old Testament narrative where we read the story about a, the prophet of God and how he allowed a woman that said, I have nothing. I have nothing. And that's the thing in the body of Christ that there, there are times when you think, I live in the greatest, most powerful nation in the world. A nation that provides for everybody. And we have so many people that are below the poverty limit. They have so many people that are registered, if you can be registered, as homeless, who have seen the loss of everything. But for some reason, we live in a nation that you would figure that we have people that are way up here. I'm saying that are so wealthy. I mean, generational wealth. I, I'm gonna be honest with you. I, I, I love America. I believe in capitalism. I believe that if you do well, you should be able to soar to the heights that you do. Somehow I just I just wonder about this. Because I, I used to tell my wife, because she would say, the athletes that gain these contracts. Right? You think about this real quick. Steph Curry signed a contract at the time, when you think about it, for $200 million for how many years, right? And back in the day, when people thought it was so big that the great Ricky Henderson of the Oakland A signed for $1 million a season. And we think, wow, that's still a lot of money. I mean, and athletes would always say this, I want to take care of my family. Well, if you ask me, $500,000 is enough to take care of your family, right? And then some. So if you're just going to play a sport and get paid $500,000, that's a lot of money. As opposed to some of us other people that are fortunate to make anything close to six figures a year. But $500,000, that's an extreme, you know, so much money. And for somebody to say, I just signed a contract in baseball for $340 million. I think that's the guy down in Anaheim. Trout, the fish name, right? That is not money to take care of you and your family. That's generational money. That's money that will take care of your great, 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 great grandchildren. Because that kind of money is like foolish money. You know, I always used to think this when, like, the young kid, his name is Zion Williams, the number one pick in the NBA draft. He's going to be the wealthiest young 19-year-old, I think, to sign mega, mega money. And people, when they see young men like that sign that kind of money, and they do something kind of foolish, we all say, well, 
how can he do something so foolish? Well, give me $500 million, and I may do something kind of foolish myself mm -hmm. at the age that I am. Because think about it, nobody's ever had that kind of money before. Here's this woman, and you gotta, you gotta kind of see where she's at. She's living a wonderful life. Her husband is a man of God, a prophet of the company of the prophets. He served God mightily. God provided for them. They had everything at their disposal. And with one false swoop, her husband died. So she lost everything. And in the ancient days, you're a widow, but when you lose your husband, you kind of have to kind of fend for yourself. I mean, it's no different than today, but in the ancient days, it was incredibly hard because you hope that you're young enough that you could probably somehow, some way, kind of remarry where somebody would take care of you. But all she has was her sons and things got really hard. And her husband probably served God and got busy doing the things of God and somehow forgot to take care of his family in that manner because his death was sudden. Well, as a credit and all the things that she and her husband compiled over time, as the creditors came a knocking, she has two young boys. And if you can't pay, then somebody else has to pay for you. So she's already lost her husband. Her livelihood is gone. She doesn't know how she's going to put meat or bread on the table. The creditors are coming to come and take away everything she has. And now, because she doesn't have anything else, the creditors are going to take her two young sons and make them slaves. Because somebody has to pay the debt. Amen? My first point this morning is trust God even when it gets worse. Amen. Trust God even when it gets worse. And I know that's an easy teach. I mean, that's not an easy teach. As a young believer, I mean, I used to think that when I first became a believer in Jesus Christ, it was almost like it was the whole thing I used to believe in being in the medical field. When babies are born, I used to think that God would put a a force field around them, you know, to protect them. But I know that's not true. I used to believe that, though, that babies were protected. I thought the same thing with young believers. I thought the same thing when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I thought that God would, you know, protect me and guard me and don't allow bad things to happen to me. Well, that was the farthest thing from the truth because I can remember when I gave my life to Jesus Christ, the way I was taught, I was taught that if I gave my life to Jesus Christ, it was a bed of roses. That everything was going to be wonderful. Everything was going to be such a blessing. I mean, God was going to take care of me. God was going to provide for me. God was going to bless me. And all those are truths. Those are all biblical truths. But that doesn't mean that you're not going to be attacked. It doesn't mean that bad things aren't going to happen to you. It doesn't mean that you're not going to go through trials as a very young believer in Jesus Christ. And to think about that, when we think about things getting worse, she was a believer in God, and because she believed so much in God, you would figure her, her husband, her, her late husband, he served you. He served you, God. And now he, you've taken him from me. I have nothing now. And now the, the creditors are coming, and I have nothing to give them. And they're looking at my two sons. I can't give my two sons. If she gives up her two sons, now she'll have nothing. And there's such a word called desperation. Turn to your neighbor and say desperation. desperation. Trust God even when it gets worse. And to me, that it just doesn't seem like it's even possible. How can you expect me to trust you? How do you expect me to just say, trust in the Lord? This is a verse, Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways. What? Acknowledge, Acknowledge God. Things not, have not only gone bad, but they've gone worse, God. They're going to take away my children. And then when they take away my children, I won't have anything. And so she is so 
desperate. And that's where I think the body of Christ needs to get. A spirit of desperation. Where we come before a holy God each and every Sunday. It doesn't matter if life is great and you have Disneyland on your mind. That we come before God. And when we come before God, we are so desperate. We want Him so much in our life. We want God to just fill us because there, we have nothing. In fact, God wants us to come. He tells us. This is the way God responds to the people of God. When we are contrite, we are broken before yes. Him. Because we're sinners. You know, they have this, this program called AA. And in AA, each one comes up to whether they're sitting around their table or they come before a podium and they say their name. My name is Ben. I'm an alcoholic. Well, Christian, we always seem like when we come to church, like everything is so great. We need to come before the household of faith and every time we hit those doors, we need to remind ourselves, Lord, I am a sinner. A sinner. Mm -hmm. I come to your house, Lord, I am unworthy. I am an, or an unworthy sinner saved by your precious grace. Amen. And the reason why we come into the household of faith is because we get to. We get to come here and God, ex he expects it. We come here because even though things have gotten worse, God expects you. He created you to worship him. You know, I have, you know, Things have gotten so bad, but here's this woman, she's so desperate. And desperation gets rid of foolish pride. You know, pride is the worst enemy in the Christian, where we don't think there's anything wrong with us, everything's fine. When I walk into the household of faith, I walk in all dignified. Look at me. I'm great. I bet you wish you were me. You know what? We got problems. First of all, you're not worthy to stand before a holy God. In fact, the prophet Isaiah said, Woe to me. Woe to me, a sinner. Desperation gets rid of foolish pride. And you think about there was a man named um, Jairus. Jairus. He was one of these religious rulers. He wasn't supposed to be. In the presence of Jesus. You think about that. In those days, there was this sect, if you will, this cult, if you will, uh -huh. this following of Jesus, if you will. And religious rulers of the day couldn't be associated. They had to stay away from Jesus. But desperation from a man who didn't believe in Jesus sought out Jesus for his daughter who was sick desperately sick. Desperation has a way of saying, I don't care what people see in me. I don't care what people might think of me. Desperation has a way of us breaking through the crowd. Desperation has a way of saying, I don't care if people see me crying. I don't care what people may think. Sure, I might drive a nice car. I might have a nice house. I might have a great job, but I can stand before a holy God and I'm not worried about what people think. I need Jesus. That's what desperation is. Right. It takes away all the barriers. It takes away everything else because that's all you want to do. So desperation can be and is, when you think on a spiritual level, it is a good thing. Amen? Amen. Desperation pushes away the comfort zone that you think you think you have. It removes all those barriers because that's the thing about desperation. You have no other place to turn but to Jesus. I think about this woman. You know, the Bible tells us that she cried out to Elijah. She had nowhere else to turn. The Bible tells us is that we, we need to trust God even when it gets worse. And the thing is, is here was the example. The wife of a, of a man of God. She understood the principle. And as I told you when we first started this whole sermon, learn to pray. She cried out to God. First thing, she didn't forget. She knew this is what you do when you're in need of God. Cry out to God. 
And we, you know what? We have a theme, and I posted it up there because I want us to be in the mindset of the entire assembly. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise. And again, you'll hear me use that word we get to, because I'm going to tell you right now, none of us get to go before the throne of grace. You think about that. Me? Who am I? I mean, the, even the Bible says that this is a response. Who am I, God, that you would be mindful of me? Mm -hmm. God told me, he allows me to go before his throne. He allows me to talk to him. He allows you, each and every one of you, you're allowed to come before his presence. And that should be something that you relish. I mean, you should be a kid and say, I get to come. I mean, a spiritual giddiness, if you will. I get to go before him. And the thing is, we don't do that with the frequency that we should to cry out to God, just to be able to say to God, God, things have gotten kind of crazy here. You know my life. And people say, why do you even pray to God when he already knows? It shows your dependency on him. You know, we just celebrated a, 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 a holiday where we, we, we literally blow up the United States of America. You ever notice that? You guys watch it? I mean, my wife and I, I mean, we hear this from the time the booths start to come out. The, you know, I think about that because I'm, I'm laughing because I think it's up in the foothills near the Santa Cruz Hills. You can't sell fireworks out there. I think the finest thousand dollars with a little popper you can't you can't sell fireworks out there but here as soon as you come into the valley bam they're everywhere you know in fact uh, Bishop Perea uh, CWC he has two booths I think back then I don't know what it is now but they they give you a booth full of inventory and you have to give them five thousand dollars and if you sell everything, you make $5,000, so it's $10,000. Thing is, is you make a profit. So if you have two booths, that's $10,000 in just one weekend. Just people go buy that stuff. I mean, we love fireworks, right? Right? Oh, yeah. Got... Okay, let's, let's think about this real quick. During the holiday, who didn't get to watch, even on the news, who didn't watch that firework go off. Can I see it happen? Anyway, so we all like to see the little boom. We like to blow stuff up. We do. And this nation, we just wanted to blow it up. I mean, it was so amazing because we watched New York City on TV because we love to sit back and have the nice screen TV, all the colors and everything with the music playing, the pageantry. You know, you get all excited. You watch the whole thing. And when we think about how this nation, we celebrate the 4th of July, our, let's say the word, independence. But you know what? When you become a Christian, you are dependent. You didn't get that. <laughs> That's what prayer is. We, we as a people of this nation, they say, hey, we're going to go all out. We're going to celebrate our Independence Day. But when you bow a knee to Jesus Christ, you are saying to God, I'm totally and wholly dependent on you. Mm -hmm. So you surrender your independence. It's kind of a contradiction in terms, right? That's what God says. That's what the verse tells us in Galatians 2.20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ, for I no longer live. You've given your life to Jesus so that he lives. He takes over your life. He decides for you. He plans your future. He has a destiny for you. He takes care of all your needs. You think about that. She had nothing else. And she cried out to the life Help me. She's essentially crying out to God saying, help me. 
the creditors are coming. And that's something I think all of us, when we think about learning to cry to God. I think of it in matters of, of learning to trust God. Even for little trivial things. Like, you know, you know God, you're so busy. God, you're too busy. I mean, you think about it. He is the creator of the universe. Will he have time for me to just ask for something so insignificant? I mean, it seems so trivial, God. But you know what? He's there saying, it's a turn. Tell me. What do you want? It doesn't, it doesn't matter to you if you think it's it's really nothing. God he says, I want to know. What do you need? I love you that much. Sure, I can move mountains. I can tear down, I can tell, bring down big <coughs> rulers. I, he, God can do everything. Mm -hmm. Yours is something as subtle as moving this here. You can't do it, but God can do it. Mm -hmm. And that's why God wants us to learn. Talk to him. Talk to him. Elijah's <coughs> wife, she knew what it was. And she reminds us in this in this fashion, when you think about it, when we cry out to God, there are times when we cry out to God that we're wondering, you know, is God going to even pay attention to me? And you know, the enemy sometimes he'll use something, and it, it, it's a reminder. It says this in John. I got to jump ahead to, to my IT people. John chapter eight, verse forty-four. It says, "For you are children of the father of the devil." This is John speaking. He says. And you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there was no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar. And then it says, he is the father of all lies. That's John 8, 44. So you think the devil is going to do everything at his disposal to prevent you from thinking God will even listen to you. And he wins all the time. Because you know what? The body of Christ, we're not praying to God. We're not praying to God. And the way I kind of know this, it says this, from the heart, from the heart, the mouth speaks, right? And I'm thinking about this. On social media, I'm on social media a lot. But as a pastor, I listen to the people of God when bad things start to happen and people do bad things. And they'll do bad things and they may be politicians or just people in general. And they'll do these bad things or say bad things and the body of Christ, we don't know how to respond in love. We don't know how to respond in the way Jesus would respond to these people. You know how we respond? We respond vindictive. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're going to say that about me, huh? Well, you know, I mean, we're, we're the body of Christ. We're to evangelize the world. We're the people that need to show God God's love. God has transformed us. We used to be haters of God, but now we're lovers of God. And because we love God, other people don't know how to love God, and they don't know that God is love. Yes. So when they say these vicious things, it kind of reminds me of the comedian. I forget his name, but he was a comedian. He's one of those Christian comedians. And he says, isn't that funny that we used to put the, the fish logo on the back of our cars? Right? Mm -hmm. And this is how you know the mentality of Christians. We used to have the fish logo, and then, of course, the atheists, they had fish with feet. Right? So we saw the fish with feet, and we go, that was kind of mean. Because they came up with their little logo, fish with feet. So then what do we do? We created a fish eating the fish with feet. <laughs> and I said, that's the Christian response, retaliation. That's the Christian response. We retaliate. And that's not what God is trying to teach us here. So we're allowing 
the father of all lies to affect us in a matter even on social media. We don't know how to love people because as Francis, Pastor Francis Chang who said, he said that if a person who was paired vision, if he was blind and he was walking in the bank and you're standing there and if he would have accidentally bumped you and step on your toe, would you go, hey, would you push him? You see him, he's, and he bumps into you because he doesn't see you. You would empathize with him. You go, oh, excuse me, sir. I'm, I'm standing right. You would help him, you know. And he would probably say, but very apologetic, oh, I'm sorry. You would empathize with that. With that same spirit, empathize with people that just don't know. Here's our example. Jesus on the cross. People mocking him. People laughing at him. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Care that much. And that's the spirit we need to have towards people that don't get it. All of us can think about our own life before we came to Jesus. We all knew what we were like before we came to Jesus. We didn't care about people. We, we spoke bad. We backstabbed them. We gossiped about them. But now that we're new creations in Christ Jesus, we can't be part of that. And now that people hate on us because we have taken on a new life, We've been crucified for, with Christ, but we no longer live the life I do live now. I live for Christ. Right? So now when people speak ill of me, people sp speak ill of the body of Christ, they speak ill of my God, I have an empathy for them. Because they just don't know. I used to be like you. If I'm pointing at you, don't think I'm pointing at you. Okay? I used to be like you. But I'm no longer like you. But I still love you. And that's, that's the mindset we used to have. And, and the prophet Elijah says in 54, chapter 54, 17, this is how you have to believe this. It says, in that coming day, no weapon turned against you will succeed. The King James Version says, no weapon formed against you will prosper. So in other words, we hold on to this. That the fire of the father of all lies is going to try to do everything possible to tell you. You don't need to pray to him. Do it on your own. He's not going to even hear you. He's not going to even listen to you. You know, look, at, things are getting worse. Is he even paying attention to you? Trust God even when it gets worse. And that was a hard teach. My second point is this. Be empty so God can fill you. Oh, I love that. How many of you love saying, come to church? I've had a hard week, God. I mean, you think about that. You have a hard week. Your week starts today. Today. You know, some of us think that because we work, we think our week starts Monday through what? Saturday? It starts Sunday. Sunday on the calendar actually says Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Some of us believe it should start Monday. In fact, on my work, it starts at a Monday. And Sunday's on the end. I don't know if you guys have that same kind of calendar, right? It kind of reminds me that Monday is my work week. But God, this is the infinite wisdom of God. Sunday begins our new week. And it allows us to come to church on Sunday. It allows us to say, God, I need a new fresh. I need you to touch me. Renew in me a new spirit within me. I've had a rough week, God. Things have been kind of ugly. I mean, some of us, we allow the dishes in our lives to just keep piling up and piling up. You guys have kitchens like that? No, okay. Good for you. Do your dishes the same way. As a Christian, don't let it pile up. Amen? Be empty so God can fill you. Elijah said, this is, this is an incredible story. It says, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. See, look at the direction here. Ask your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. 
their neighbors are going to get to participate in the miraculous. Right? How many of you guys borrow things from your neighbors? We don't do that anymore, huh? Growing up, my mom go go ask the Lily Taurus for some sugar, right? My mom, would, we would do that. We'd run and we'd get, borrow things from each other. My dad go go borrow from the Borrega family. He has a big ladder to borrow from him. We don't do that now. That's why we have fences. We have these fences. And we, when they have a party, we don't even know who they are. In fact, my neighbor, you know, I'm queuing it up in the back. I barely can hear him. He goes, sure is mean, Ben. That's all I hear. <laughs> I know I've, I've taken a little detour. It says this, Elijah said, go around to all your neighbors and, and don't just ask for a few. And then he says the instructions, he says, then go inside, shut the door behind you and your sons. Then he says, pour oil into all the jars as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. Turn to your neighbor and say, she kept pouring. She kept pouring. The illustration. I don't know why it has a little bubble on there, but it does. Okay, but I want you to think about this. I have nothing in my home, but all I have is a, this little jar of oil. It's not much. I mean, I want you to think about that. When we say we have nothing, and we tell God, "This is all I have," God is back saying, "Man, you got a lot." That's God. God. This is all I have, God. I have nothing. This is all I have, God. Goes, are you kidding me? That's all you have? See the difference? We're crying to God. Oh, woe is me. This is all I have. It's foreign. That's the way God sees This is the way we go before God. And God sees it and says, Man, you got a lot. That's incredible. Man. And we're probably turning to God and saying, All right, did you hear me? This, I have nothing. And God is saying, Man, that's a lot. God is incredible. Yes. And then he gives her instructions. And I'm thinking, he tells her, Go inside the house, shut the door behind you and your sons, and then take that. Nothing that you say. And again, like I said, the neighbors had an opportunity to participate. Because they know she has nothing. Because I believe, it doesn't say this in the story, but I believe she's been begging and begging and begging. So all they, also from now, her sons go to all the house and say, we need empty vessels. And I don't have one here. But if I did, it would be those empty water vessels, right? Just vessels everywhere of different sizes, right? So they collect them and they all bring them. And then it says this. When she shut the door behind her, they brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. I want you to think about this. I have to put this on there just in case, okay? So she takes these, just visualize, she takes these, these vessels, they're empty, and she begins to pour. You, you gotta be thinking, if this is all I have, Right? And, and let's say this is the vessel. Right? And I begin to pour. And I'm pouring. I should be able to see this thing go boom. But it, it keeps pouring. And then I'm watching this thing go It fills up. And I say, hey, it's filling. I'm looking at this. And this fills up. I had to tell one of my sons to not go bring, bring me another one. Right? So he brings a bigger one. It's one of these big old tanker looking things. And she's looking at this. She saw how much she filled up that one. And she begins pouring. And this starts. And it fills up to the top. And she's saying, I need another one. And she keeps going. And the same process, it just keeps filling and filling and filling and filling. And she just keeps going, filling 
and fill it. And she, oh, this is a little small one. It fills that quick, and she just keeps going and going and going. And she turns to her son. I, I bet you if that were me, I would be analyzing this. But she just kept going, and it just kept filling and filling. The Bible says in verse five, they brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. I want you to think about that. Romans 6, 13 says this. Do not let any part of your body become instruments of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourself completely to God. For, for you were dead, but now you have a new life. So use your whole body as instruments to do what is right for the glory of God. So in other words, I'm no longer of that life. I'm in this life. And because I'm starting to see how God is using this nothing that I said, I'm, I have to be thinking this, and you, you guys got to see this with me. I got this big old tub, and it's still flowing. And I don't know how it's, it's filling. And it continues to fill. And I'm probably going, how's that happening? And the book of Romans tells us that now, because of my faith. It's just, God continues. I thought I had needs with that big tub. And I'm, I'm calculating in my head. I don't believe the woman was thinking that. But I'm calculating. That's going to last years. I had nothing. This is just a small vat right here that I just filled. It filled up so quickly with this small amount. It filled up and I'm looking around the room, and the room is getting crowded, and I keep telling my sons, bring me another one, bring me another one, and they bring another one. It's something that I, I don't understand, but people somehow, some way are, are blessing me, and we have as many empty vessels, and God tells us, and this is the illustration, this is the application, when you're empty, you need to come before God empty. The psalmist writes in 51, 12, it says, Restore me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Yes. That's David. King David penned that. And it reminds us that every time we come before a holy God, I come before God empty. My, my week might have been so bad, I might have caused so many bad things to come before me. I may have said things or thought things that were bad, that were contrary to God, but I need to get rid of all that stuff. I need to come before God and say, God, I've had a rough week, but I'm going to come before your gates of thanksgiving saying, God, purge me of all that. Get rid of all that stuff, God. I want to come before you so that you can fill me. That's why we, when we come before worship, we should not have to tell you guys, let's raise our hands to the Lord. I want you to look at this. It almost looks like a funnel, doesn't it? It almost is. On a spiritual level, we're telling God, fill me. I have so much stuff. I don't know if you've ever seen this illustration. If I had it, I would do it. But if we were a glass, and let's say the glass was filled with so much filth. My wife did this at a woman's retreat. And it was so filthy with dirt and all kinds of mud. You would look at it and I would tell you, now drink. Of course you're not going to drink it. But then, this is how God is with us. God wants to fill us. And even if you come before God and you've got stuff, and you take this pitcher of clear water, and you begin to pour it in there. As the water begins to stir, all that bad stuff, all the impurities, all the bad dirt and the mud, as it begins to fill, it begins to what? Spill over. And more and more, that dark mud, water, murky water gets clearer and clearer and clearer. So as, as the water keeps continuing to pour, the more that water comes out of there, eventually that glass, is going to be crystal clear before a holy God. God just wants you to say, God, 
fill me up. Amen. Fill me up, God. That's why I come to worship. I come to worship because God has been a rough week. I come to worship God because it's been a great week. I come to worship God that I was, it's been a fulfilling week. God, I come to work, God, I come to church, God, because maybe things, some of us have even come to work, I mean to church. We come to church and maybe our households aren't intact. Maybe the kids are off doing some crazy things. Maybe your marriage is kind of hard and you're wondering, God, I've had a rough time this week. And all we want, God, is look at me. Look how ugly it is right now, God. And all God wants to do is to take your life and just fill you to overflowing. Amen. But are we willing, as David says, am I a willing spirit to let God be God? Yes. And it says to cleanse me, to purify me, to get rid of all that stuff. And that's all God wants to do. That's all he wants to do in us, to just take the way we were, knowing that you're my child, and I want to take your life the way it is right now. You've made a mess of it. you made bad decisions, but it doesn't matter because you're coming for God, and God is still God. God is still on the throne. He's going to take care of you. Right now. And he's going, to, he's going to just remove all that stuff so that you could leave here renewed, refreshed. Amen? That wonderful song I sing, I love to sing it. It's dwelling in your presence. Dwelling in your presence. Constantly where God just fills me up. And just things, if I feel so overwhelmed by the cares of the world, I know that God will just get rid of all that and just fill me to overflowing. And then I can just, just feel great in his presence. Amen? Mm -hmm. Lastly, so we go from, so you're with me, right? We go from trust even when, get, uh, when it gets worse to be empty so God can fill you. And then, of course, lastly, God tells us, I'm there. It says, <coughs> God's sufficiency, amen. Mm -hmm. That's my last point. And we don't think after all that things have gotten worse, God, I have nothing in God could begins to fill me up to overflowing. And then I just recognize, and this is the thing. It says in verse 6, when all the jars were full, right there, an amen should come from us. Amen. 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 I, I think of that, and I think of all the neighbors who participated in this miraculous feat. They gave of their empties. I mean, think about it. I was thinking about this just now. The neighbors who gave empty vessels are going to be the same neighbors that buy her oil. Yeah. <laughs> right. I just thought about that just now. I says, okay, you give me something to borrow, and I'm going to give it back to you because it belongs to you, right? But I'm going to turn around and say, thank you for letting me borrow this big vessel. Or would you like to buy it from me now? <laughs> it belongs to you. If you don't, hold on a second. I'll pour it out. Oh, no, 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 no. I need that. God's sufficiency. Amen. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. This is the beauty of this whole story. But he replied, there's not a jar left. And it said, and then the oil stopped. This, this kept pouring and pouring and pouring. Bring me another one. Bring me another one. No more. No more. Stops. It's God. God knows. God knows. God knows. God knows all that you need. I'm going to share this passage with you. Obviously, i, I got to jump ahead to Ephesians. It says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, says, Now to him, this is the prayer of Paul to the church of Ephesus, Now to him who was able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. 
I like to define that, ask for, imagine, or fantasize. I mean, I think about that because God knows I have these tremendous fantasies about what God's going to do. I mean, that's almost saying, according to the power that is in work. You see, you need to grab hold of what Paul says here. According to his power that is at work in us. Right? Paul knew that. So in other words, the Holy Spirit that is in us, you go back to this, it's God's sufficiency. God is sufficient. God provides all of my needs. God is able to immeasurably more than I could ever ask or imagine. This woman who had nothing turned something this small to filling her entire household where everything was so much more that she will be able to sell off to people and would sustain her and her household for a long, long time. And to me, as long as the man of God is in the house, as long as God is in the house, yes. you didn't get that. Well, I had to say, God, as long as God is in the house, you're going to be provided. God's sufficiency. That's God. God in your life. God always blessing you. God always providing for you. God always being in your presence. And then you, as a person of God, needs to say this. And, and say with, I mean, literally say this when you come before the house, knowing that God has blessed me. God is protecting me. God has been with me. God is taking care of me. God is healing me. God is doing just those things for now. And when you come into the household of faith, you mean to tell me that these people that are up here have to tell you, come on, church. Come on, church. Let's worship him. God does all that for you. You get to come in. You get to come in. And God has done all, before you even came in the door, you, God has done all that for you. You didn't walk here. You came here with music beating in your car, air conditioning, right? Or somebody picked you up. God allowed you to come in here, and now it takes somebody on the worship team to tell you, come on, church, come on. I mean, you got to think about this. Church, I shouldn't even have to tell you what to do and how to do it. I mean, an embarrassment to me, to me as pastor, is my Abba Father, because all we're doing is joining heaven. I mean, you don't think of this, but I remember it was Pastor Nathan said this. He said that every time, and let's be intimate, Bethany Christian Center of Stockton, California joins in worship in heaven. We're joining them. Mm -hmm. I want you to think about this. If they made the announcement, I know they don't do this. But let's say they did. If they, they're up in the heavenlies right now, crazy. And they go, we want to welcome Bethany Christian Center as they join us in worship. Mm -hmm. And our worship team has to say, come on, church. Mm -hmm. Because all of heaven starts saying, yeah, they're joining us. And we're like, they're looking at us. Hey, you guys are going to get in or what? You going to get in? And our, I mean, our worship leader has to do all these gyrations. Come on. What are you guys doing? Come on, you can't do this. Come on. I know some veterans for the war that lost their arms that wish they could do this. Come on now. Because they're grateful they're home. Amen. But we're here in air conditioning, mm -hmm. knowing that the God of the universe saved us from the pit of hell, mm -hmm. brought us into his wonderful life. And because he brought us into his wonderful life, he has provided, cared for us, provided for us, blessed us. And it takes a worship leader to get you to do what? We have a lot to learn. Things aren't well in your life. Things are getting worse in your life. 
praise him anyway. Amen. Amen. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Yes. Enter his courts with yes. praise. Yes. Come in. You're welcome. You get to do this. Yes. But enter it with already in an attitude of praise. Yes. I mean, you should literally be dancing as you come in. I mean, sister, sister Nancy almost she grabbed me here. I was like, well, are we dancing up here? I mean, she grabbed me and I was like, well, she was just going to greet me. But it made me feel good. It made me feel good because you know what? That is the spirit we need to have. This is my father's house. And because it's my father's house, he allows me to worship. He allows me to be myself. He allows me to say, God, I love you, God. I praise you, God. I adore you, God. And I don't have to look to my left or right to worry about what people think of me because he's my God. And because he's my God, I'm going to give him my all. I'm going to give him my all. He deserves that. He is worthy of that. Hallelujah. I think about God and our theme. It's a personal invitation. You know, I know that it's it's a 40 minute, 50 minute trek from here to Elk Grove if you're going to drive there. But I, I'm just I'm just inviting you. You're all invited already. But if you get an opportunity to go for the services in the evening, don't miss out. If you and for those of you that are retired, okay, those of you that are retired, we have great speakers and Pastor Bernie and Pastor Francis. They're going to be speaking. So if you can be there during the afternoon, Amen. try to join us because this is this is our body here. Come in and be blessed. That's our theme. Enter His courts. And you're going to be fortified. You're going to be built up. You're going to be edified because of this. I truly believe that God is going to do an incredible thing yes. in our convention. Amen. And you need to know this. We have had all these themes, wonderful themes. Don't get me wrong. We've had all these beautiful themes just been ushered in by mighty men of God who says, I believe God is leading us there and God is leading there. But to, to, for God to tell us, Let's address worship. Let's address prayer. Because the body of Christ, we need to learn that. Because we don't know how long we're going to be able to do what we're doing right now. Right. Let me hear let me, let me, so you understand that. You're hearing me say this. I am Again, I am not a prophet. But we don't know how much longer we'll be able to do this in California. Where we'll be able to say the name. Where we have said that. Jesus. Amen. We did that with great frequency. We were saying, Jesus! Amen. There'll be a day when that name will not be able to be said in the United States of America. It's going to be ugly. We've never been persecuted like, we, like they're being persecuted in other non nations. But this nation that was founded on these type of Christian, Christian principles are now a small minority or segment of people are now saying we can't have God. It's starting here in the great state of California. Mm -hmm. They're going to eradicate it. And as a pastor of, of Jesus Christ, guess what? You may have to bail me out of prison. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> I will not bail. Mm -hmm. I will not compromise. Amen. Mm -hmm. I will not. Right. Because the Bible tells me man may do what? That man may even kill you, but God, the soul, right? I would rather stand before God and say, God, I'm for you, than stand before the politicians and say, I'll bow before you. Amen. Amen. You get to worship right now free. You get to do this. Yes. I'm believing. If you get to do this freely, come on, church. Do it. Yes. Do it. Amen. I mean, all of a sudden, if they take away our freedom to worship now, you're going to say, hey, I don't need to raise my hand anymore. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even have to clap. Because if I do, I'll get in trouble. Oh, yeah. We're going to separate the sheep from the goats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's 
community service, so I decided to go a little longer. <laughs> All right. God's sufficiency. In fact, it says this. I didn't even use this verse, but it says in 2 Corinthians. And I'll close with this. This is the Apostle Paul in doing some difficult time in his life. As he asked God, this is Paul praying to God. But Jesus said this, my grace is, for, is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Mm -hmm. Then Paul responds, therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Yes. Man. I mean, think about that. I'm going to come before this pulpit and just tell everybody, you know, I feel inadequate. You know what? I, 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 I'm a sinner. I, I mean, that's Paul. Mm -hmm. Paul says, I've got all this stuff against me. I'm the worst of all sinners. I would boast upon my weaknesses so that Christ's power yes. may be manifested. Yes. Amen? Amen. Amen. As opposed to saying, hey, give me all my accolades. Uh -huh. Come on, lavish me up. That was Paul. Paul said, I'm going to boast on the weaknesses so that not me, that God will be glorified. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord.